My name is Christopher Fisher, and on behalf of the Marshall Commission, I'd like to welcome you all to Edinburgh and the forthcoming lecture by Dan Jurgen. Let me extend a particular welcome to the current Marshall Scholars, to other students attending from Scottish universities, and to our distinguished guests from the academic and energy communities in Scotland. It has become a feature of the Marshall Scholarship Programme that during the Easter vacation, we organize a small conference outside of London to broaden the understanding of our scholars to issues across the UK, including dance methods north of the border. <laughs> to this end, we are delighted to be returning to Scotland, at whose universities some 100 Marshall scholars have studied over the last 60 years, including four current scholars. Over the next couple of days, we can look forward to a program of activities hosted by the universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow, commencing with this lecture. We thank them for their hospitality and support. If this lecture is, is the start of one series of events, it is also the end of another, namely a lecture series given by invited former Marshall scholars to mark the formation of the Marshall Commission in 1953, the creation of the Associated Scholarship Program, and the attendance of the first Marshall Scholars at British universities. This lecture series, which has already involved talks in Cardiff, London, and Belfast, given by, respectively, Harvard Professor Doug Melton, US Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Anne Applebaum, was initiated and overseen by my predecessor, Dr. John Hughes, with the, with the invaluable support of Mary Denyer. As to this evening's programme, I will shortly ask Professor Sir Timothy O'Shea, Principal of the University of Edinburgh, to say a few words to introduce this evening's esteemed lecturer, who will then speak to us. Afterwards, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers, and the evening will conclude by the presentation of a Marshall Medal to Dr. Dan Jurgen by John Hughes. Let me now, therefore, turn to Sir Timothy. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm really delighted to welcome you to the University of Edinburgh and to this 60th anniversary lecture. As you've heard, um, our lecture this evening is by Dr. Daniel Jurgen and is the last of a series of four lectures by very distinguished Marshall alumni. The University of Edinburgh itself uh, was founded in 1583 and its links uh, go back over the 400 years. And in fact, 200 years ago, 10% uh, of our students uh, came from North America. Uh, and we, at the current time, it's gone down to 6%, but it's about, it's about 2,500, so there is a very strong, continuous record. It also goes in the other direction. Uh, the first president of Princeton, the founder, and first president of the College of William and Mary, the founders of New York's first uh, medical school, all were graduates from here. And two signatories uh, of the Declaration of Independence, John Witherspoon and Benjamin Rush, were both Edinburgh graduates. Today we have over 6,000 alumni, and we are very proud of the Marshall Scholars amongst those. Over the past 60 years, we've welcomed 65 Marshall Scholars here, and we're delighted that we currently have two studying with us, Anna Worry studying a Master's by Research in Social Anthropology, and Hope Bretcher, who is studying a Master's in Science and Technology in Society. Over the years, several Marshall Scholars have happily decided to settle uh, in Edinburgh, and we currently have five uh, Marshall alumni on the faculty. Uh, Dr. Stephen Brusetti, who is a Chancellor's Fellow in Vertebrate Paleontology. Dr. Tara Spira jones a Reader and Chancellor's Fellow in our Centre for Cognitive and Neural Systems. Dr. Anna Van Inskia, a lecturer in English Language. Dr. Jean Carletta, a Senior Research Fellow within Informatics, where we are. And Dr. Ellen Gurman bard a Reader in our Linguistics Department. I'm also delighted that Dr. Francis Dow, a former vice principal of our university, who served as chair of the Marshall Aid Commemoration Commission for four years, received a Marshall Medal to, to mark the 60 year anniversary. Now, we, tonight we have the great honor of welcoming Dr. Daniel Jurgen, Pulitzer Prize winner, former Marshall Scholar. He's a highly respected authority on energy, international politics, and economics, and is vice chair of the global research firm IHS and founder of IHS Cambridge Energy Research Associates. He's a graduate of Yale and Cambridge 
and at Cambridge he was a Marshall Scholar while studying for his doctorate. He's worked as a lecturer at the Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's written a number of books and is the author of the number one bestseller, which has been translated into 20 languages, The Prize, The Epic Quest for Oil, Money and Power, winning him the Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction in 1992, and the Eccles Prize for the best book on economics for a general audience. The book was so successful that it was adapted into a miniseries seen by more than 20 million viewers. In 2014, the Prime Minister of India presented Dr. Jurgen with a Lifetime Achievement Award, and the US Department of Energy awarded him the first James Schlesinger Medal for Energy Security. He has many other awards and distinctions. He's a director of the Council of Foreign Relations, a trustee of the Brookings Institution, a member of the US Natural, National Petroleum Council, and a director of the United States Energy Association. So it's a, just a tremendous pleasure uh, to invite him to address you. Principal O'Shea, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for that welcome. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here, uh, obviously, with John Hughes and with uh, Chris Fisher, uh, who have, uh, have devoted themselves, and Chris will now, to the, to the marshals. I'm very glad to see so many marshals here. I, I, I have to say, Principal O'Shea, I don't consider myself a former marshal. I consider myself still a marshal, and I think it sticks with one uh, throughout one's entire life. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a wonderful program and uh, welcome the students, the marshals here, and all the students who are here, and uh, this distinguished audience. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to join you. In 1881, uh, William Thompson, who was a professor of natural philosophy at uh, the University of Glasgow, uh, better known as uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, took the platform at the British Association for the Advancement of Science to deliver the presidential address. And the address that he delivered was a very sober message. He said that Britain's energy position was precarious, uh, it, disaster was impending. He was speaking not of oil, current state of the North Sea, not of natural gas, but rather coal, on which had been based British economic preeminence and also its global position. He said Britain's days of greatness were numbered because subterranean coal stores of the world were becoming exhausted surely, and he added, not slowly. The days were coming, he said, when so little would be left. The only hope, he said in 1881, is that windmills or wind motors in some form will again be in the ascendant. So 1881, wind power was seen as a solution. Uh, as it turned out, things didn't turn out that way. Uh, but this theme of shortage and surplus is, uh, is in energy and the response in terms of innovation and in terms of policy and where we are today, these are the themes that I'll be addressing in this Marshall Lecture. Uh, the Marshall Scholarship itself is actually a response to innovation. In this case, not technological innovation, but policy innovation when it was so desperately needed. The innovation was called the Marshall Plan. It was a response to an emergency. Uh, by coincidence, and uh, John and I were both students at uh, Cambridge in the doctoral program there, uh, I wrote about it in my dissertation at Cambridge and then in a, my first book, which was called Shattered Peace. Um, in 1947, two years after the end of the First World War, uh, Europe, including Britain, was really in a deep crisis. It was a landscape of devastation, short of, shortage of food, shortage of energy, millions of people in displaced persons camps, and it was made worse by what was called a Siberian winter. One official said, you do not have to read the New York Times to know that people are starving. It was also a political crisis because Joseph Stalin was extending the control of the Soviet Union over Eastern Europe. In May of 1947, the Soviets took over Hungary. Jo German totalitarianism was being replaced by Soviet totalitarianism. And France and Italy, with huge communist parties, were thought to be next. In this context, at the Harvard commencement in 1947, Secretary of State George Marshall launched the idea of the Marshall Plan. He spoke about the need to address in Europe hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos, and revive the economy. Uh, interestingly, because of concerns about Republic isola Republican isolationism in the Congress, the speech was really played down in the United States, but the entire speech was read 
completely on the BBC. And one of the people who was listening to it was Ernest Bevan, who was a foreign secretary, and he got it immediately, called the French foreign minister, and called a conference together, which is really where the Marshall Plan was started to be uh, implemented. And the goal was not relief, but reconstruction. Europeans, including the Britons, would take the initiative. Um, you know, one does wonder in the present political situation in the United States, would some initiative like this have been possible? But that's a subject of another speech. <laughs> but it was possible at the time. Churchill, Winston Churchill, said it was the most unselfish act by a major country in the history of the world. And out of that came European recovery, the European uh, economic miracles, and Stalin was stopped. So as already pointed out, the Marshall Scholarship, of which many of us in this room are beneficiaries, was established in 1953 to be a living memorial, uh, not a statue, but a living memorial, and to reflect lasting bonds between the United Kingdom and the United States. And if you look across uh, American life uh, in academics, in research, business, government, as well as here as Edinburgh University, you'll see the Marshalls, and perhaps, uh, if as it looks now, Hillary Clinton's the next president, perhaps her Secretary of State will be a Marshall as well. So these lectures are meant to commemorate the Marshall Scholarship and the Marshall, Pro Marshall Plan and uh, to address key topics. And so I've taken as my topic shortage and surplus. And these shortages and surplus have not only economic consequences, but also political consequences, including here in Scotland. Uh, look at finances of Scotland today compared to a couple of years ago when it was assumed that oil would be $120 a barrel forever, rather where it is today somewhat under $40 a barrel. $100 barrel, dollars a barrel was assumed to be permanent, and it was, that price came off a period of, of shortage. Uh, I think there'll be different views, but I think the idea of North Sea oil at that high price was one of the foundations uh, for thinking about Scottish independence. And it's not for me to ponder uh, about what a lower price might have done to thinking. But I did note, as I was preparing this, that the Scottish referendum uh, was on September 18th, 2014. And the very week before was when the oil price started to go down below $100 a barrel and kept on going and kept on declining. So you've seen the impact since then on the Scottish economy and revenues as it's been having its impact around the world. So it's just a thought to, to ponder uh, those uh, coincidences. But let me return to Lord Kelvin. So his prediction of shortage made in 1881, turned out there was no shortage. Over the next three decades, uh, British coal production actually doubled. Uh, a little more than two decades before his speech in 1859, uh, the first commercial oil production began in the United States. But interestingly, it took until the 1960s before oil overtook, actually overtook coal uh, as the world's number one energy resource. And coal continued to grow. Uh, just between 2004 and 2014, uh, coal production around the world increased uh, by a third uh, in response to economic growth in India and China and other countries. So uh, I, in my work in, in was clear in the prize and also in the most recent book I've done, The Quest, I really became very interested in how going through these cycles of shortage and surplus and how much not only economically and technologically but also politically results from it. So let me turn to uh, oil where running out has been a recurrent theme. Uh, some of you will know the term peak oil. It was very much in vogue eight or nine years ago and widely believed that the world was about to run out. Uh, and it seemed to be a, a, a fashion almost. Even the German army uh, did a study uh, predicting uh, the end of oil. But my response, as I laid out in uh, this latest book I did, uh, The Quest, was actually, uh, this was, uh, yes, the world was running out of oil, but this was not the first time the world was running out of oil, but actually the fifth time the world was any, running out of oil. In the 1880s, one of John D. Rockefeller's uh, top associates sold all of his shares, not all of it, but a significant part of his shares in Standard Oil at a discount because he was convinced, uh, as people did think at that time, that oil was going to run out. And he not only did that, but he actually pledged. He said, I'll drink every barrel of oil that's found west of the Mississippi. A lot of oil was then found west of the Mississippi, <laughs> and he put that pledge aside. But World War I, uh, 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 
oil was really became a strategic necessity. Uh, it was, you know, the, the Wright brothers only took to the air in, in 1903, but already by World War I, aviation was an important part of the war, just how fast it happened. It reminds you, when things get going, they can really get going. And the lorries, the trucks, uh, the airplanes, motorcycle uh, autos, and what Winston Churchill dubbed the cistern, uh, when it was under a code project, but be better, became better known as tanks. Uh, all of these, of course, required oil for their uh, locomotion. And world, so one, the strategic importance of oil was uh, established. It also meant great interest in the Middle East in a whole new dimension. But World War I ended with a great fear of oil running out. And at that time, the main supplier of oil was the United States, uh, by far the world supplier. And just to give you a sense of the mood of the time, in the early 1920s, the director of the US Bureau of Mines declared, within the next two to five years, the oil fields of this country will reach their maximum production, and from that time on, we will face an ever-increasing decline. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson uh, managed to shorten, get that into a shorter phrase when he said, I suppose I must now walk to church. <laughs> but prices provided a stimulus to activity and innovation. Seismic technology, which is used for uh, identifying resources underground, was, a, uh, was developed in the 1920s, adapting a technology which had been used during World War I to detect en enemy gun emplacements, and that opened up new horizons. And new territories were added. Much more oil was found uh, west of the Mississippi in the great oil fields of uh, Texas and uh, Oklahoma, just talking with the principal about uh, the oil fields of uh, Texas before we started. Um, and instead of skyrocketing prices as expected, the price of oil went down. And to give you a sense of the, of the price, the cost, not of a liter, not of a gallon, but a barrel, which is 42 gallons, went down as low as 10 cents a barrel. And there was such an oversupply that petrol stations, gasoline stations in Texas, gave away free chickens as premiums to get people to come in and fill up their cars. <laughs> World War II uh, demonstrated even more the strategic importance of oil. World War I had been characterized by the stalemate of trench warfare. World War II was truly a war of mobility. One of Hitler's main objectives for attacking the Soviet Union in 1941 was to get his hands on the oil of the Caucasus, Baku, as it's now known as Azerbaijan. And the same goes for the Japanese decision to go into Indonesia, uh, Dutch East Indies, as that was called at the time, was to get the oil fields there. Both Axis powers really ran out of oil by the, by, before, as the war was coming to an end. But after the war, once again, there was a great fear of running out. During World War II, uh, six of every seven barrels of oil that were found in the, used by the Allies came from the United States. And there was a sense it's going to run out. And so uh, there was this drive to open up the Middle East. Instead of shortage, what happened, a huge new wave of oil came from the Middle East, and the price of oil went down, not up. And in fact, it was those falling prices that uh, stimulated a group of uh, oil exporting countries to get together and form an organization called OPEC, which uh, at the top, at, in its initial years was considered so irrelevant it couldn't even get diplomatic status in Geneva and ended up opening in, uh, in uh, Vienna. Well, then came the 1970s, the rapid economic growth in Europe and Japan led to tight oil markets. This coincided with tensions in the Middle East the Yom Kippur War, the attack on Israel, and an oil embargo by Arab exporters against various countries in the West. Panic engulfed uh, the world. Prices quadrupled. Once again, it was thought that it was an era of permanent shortage. And once again, price had their impact. New areas and new technologies. Uh, uh, and the big new de technology was the, de the ability to go out into the offshore. Scotland became a huge beneficiary. North Sea oil discoveries began in 1968, but it was only after 1973 that there was the drive and the economics to push the engineering and the technology to really uh, open uh, the North Sea. I remember uh, interviewing one oil man for the prize and the way he put it, because um, the, the companies had been active in the Middle East and they had been nationalized, the way he put it, he said the kitty died and we needed to find a new kitty, and the new kitty was the North Sea, was Alaska, uh, and. Uh, uh, other parts of the world. As a Marshall Scholar at that time, 
I supplemented my generous stipend, and it was generous, uh, and wrote an article for the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine uh, called Britain Drills and Praise. And I was telling uh, John as we were walking over, I went back, and Chris, I, I read it in anticipation of this. It was very interesting for me to read it because it was ostensibly about North Sea oil and what its prospects were and going out in North Sea. But a third of it was about Scottish nationalism, so uh, on the agenda even at that time. Well, the shorter to the 1970s turned into what again? A glut and price collapsed, hitting Scotland hard. Uh, prices in due course recovered. So that brings us to the present era. The received wisdom, if we go back, if we scroll back 13 years, if we go back to 2003, was the oil price was 20, that was the right price, and that was going to be the price forever. But then what occurred was a momentous change in world economic history. And it, this is the emergence of the emerging markets. The term BRICS, uh, many of you will know that term, was coined in 2001. It meant Brazil, Russia, India, and China, large emerging markets. But it only became evident in 2004 when you started to see really this dramatic change in the world economy, particularly, of course, in China. And it's led to what we see today, which is really a rebalancing of the world economy. In that period, 2004 to 2014, the Chinese economy grew two and a half times over. The Indian economy doubled. In that same time, the US economy increased 16%, Europe 10%. This kind of growth in countries at that stage of development led to an incredible hunger, huge demand for commodities. Markets became stretched tight, and it was, it was, it was, it was a demand shock. It was the demand for these commodities uh, as, com as economies grew that sent prices spiraling up. And it became known in, um, in, sort of in, the, in the lore as the, the super cycle in commodities. Oil was part of that. 40, oil grew a lot over those years. 45% of the growth was concentrated in one country, 45% in China. And the influence of China on the world economy was huge. So oil went from $20 a barrel to $147 a barrel, went down in the 2008 banking crisis, then settled at $100 and thought permanently. But once again, you see that prices are a stimulus to innovation. And the biggest energy innovation in this century so far, and I will put a caveat on that so far, uh, is the shale revolution, hydraulic fracturing, fracking. And as we'll see in the cases of other innovation, it's a result of individuals or small groups making it happen. The wisdom was that you could not get commercial gas out of dense shale rock. One man named George P. Mitchell, who was not a Houston oil man, he was a Houston gas man, he really liked gas, he hated coal. Uh, he became convinced in 1982 that you could get shale gas out of these dense rocks. The textbook said it was not possible to do that. He did it because he believed in it. He also did it for commercial reasons because he had a big contract for Chicago that he had to fulfill. And so he started in 1982 having his people work on it in the company. And it went on and on with no success. And the people working for him said, you know, George, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your money. He said, it's my time, my money. And he kept him at it for 15 years. First breakthrough, started in 82, first breakthrough in 1998, second breakthrough, 2003. So it took really uh, uh, many years uh, to get there, uh, really a couple of decades to get there. Uh, but this breakthrough was really unnoticed until 2008 when, uh, when started to see US supplies increasing and just last, well, no, in February, the first shipment of liquefied natural gas LNG left uh, Texas uh, for the world market. And just 10 years earlier, it was assumed that the United States was going to be the largest importer of natural gas in the world. So uh, the US could actually end up being the largest exporter uh, by the next decade. And interestingly, the United Kingdom is already slated uh, to get a substantial part of its natural gas uh, from uh, the United States. Now, immediately, many of you are thinking about the environmental issues that are very well uh, discussed about shale gas. And um, in 2011, uh, President Obama gave a speech in which he said, this is a major breakthrough. It could be very beneficial to the economy, but we've got to address the environmental uh, aspects of it. So he established a committee 
uh, that I served on, and we spent about seven or eight months looking at the environmental aspects of it and trying to separate the emotion and the polemics from the reality. And the conclusion of this committee, which included some very prominent e environmentalists, that if properly managed and regulated, uh, would not poise, uh, pose the environmental risks that are so often cited, uh, and that there was a lot of myths around it, it has to be properly done and properly um, uh, uh, regulated. Uh, one reason that the Obama administration uh, embraced this innovation was because of the economic situation in the United States. The administration was being uh, attacked for lack of job creation after 2008, and this turned out to be the biggest generator of jobs in the United States for several years. We had a, a big conference that we do in Houston in 2014. We had Ben Bernanke just after he stepped down as chairman of the Federal Reserve, and I asked him about this shale revolution, and he said it was one of the most positive things to have happened to the U.S. economy since 2008, and then he paused and said that maybe it was the most positive because you know, almost all the job creation was concentrated there. Not true now, given what's happened. Um, but I think the jobs and the supply chain, I believe, is one reason that the British government, at least this government, has also said that in principle it favors shale development because it also looks at it as an economic development tool. Well, that was gas. Uh, admits much skepticism, uh, this technology around 2008, 2009 was applied to oil, and then saw something really extraordinary, because the psychology had been peak oil, the U.S. was going to run out, its days were finished, very much sounded like Lord Kelvin, but from 2008 to 2015, U.S. oil production increased by uh, 4.7 million barrels a day. Now, that's just a number, so you say, well, give me some sense of, of the relationship of that number. Uh, that number is, um, just the increase is bigger than the total, the oil output of every single country in o OPEC except Saudi Arabia. That number, that increase is almost double the entire production of the North Sea. So it was very dramatic and very significant having this amount of production come into uh, play. It's had many impacts, including foreign policy impacts. I think that uh, the nuclear agreement with Iran probably would not have happened had it not been for shale oil. And the reason is because, and I think the Iranians believe this, they thought that the sanctions that were put on Iran would break because the oil market would become very tight. And they certainly <coughs> did not see uh, this surge of supply. So that was, I think, one very direct impact of it. But supply kept increasing. Uh, and that combined with a, a, a slowing world economy, what Christine Lagarde, the head of the International Monetary uh, a fund calls uh, the new mediocre in the world economy, which is still very much uh, of concern today. And that set the stage for the price collapse that, uh, that we've now seen. So oil went from $100 a barrel down into the 20s. It's now around 40. Uh, and it's gone on for a long time. It's gone on for uh, this decline for almost 20 months. Uh, companies are responding by cutting uh, their spending and certainly that's very evident in Aberdeen, what's happening in other parts of the world. Uh, at IHS, we see spending over this period 2015 to 2020 will be $2 trillion lower than had been anticipated. So there's great pessimism now. I think that will change. But at these uh, prices, will not add new production. And yet you do look, you look at the world and say, if we do have a decent world economy and decent economic growth, we will need a, about another 5 million barrels a day of supply by 2020. And so it's a question of where those supplies will come from. I think governments will have to respond and are responding. And you've seen some changes in the fiscal system in the UK in response to it. Because in a sense, it's no longer, if you look at governments and companies as a market and where where it was a, a seller's market, that the governments could be very tough in their terms. It's now a buyer's market because companies have cut their budget so much and governments are going to be more, much more flexible. Uh, we had uh, the president of Mexico at our conference who talked about Mexico's historic opening up and then their need, as they found, to be more flexible in this environment to attract an, uh, investment. So I've said that, and that was my caveat a little while ago, that the biggest innovation in this century was uh, shale so far. And so I know some of you are asking yourself, well, wait a second, what about wind and solar? And my answer is that wind and solar are big innovations of the last century. 
They too are responses, uh, the wind and solar industry as we know them today, to the shortages and the crises of the 1970s, like North Sea Oil. Uh, it was at a very interesting time when writing the Quest, interviewing the founders of both the modern solar industry and the modern wind industry. The U.S. solar industry was founded in 1973 by two Hungarian refugees who had left Hungary during the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 and then gone to work for the U.S. government on satellites and then decided in 1973, just on the eve of the oil crisis, to launch their own solar company. Uh, the modern <coughs> wind industry got going in, in the 1970s and it failed. Uh, it was a big companies went into it and it just didn't take off. So I, if you ask me when was a modern wind industry born, I, I can be very precise, I can give you the date. It was New Year's Eve, 1981. So what happened then? A man uh, uh, named Jim Delson, who was a, wanted to be a wind entrepreneur, spent New Year's Eve in a blizzard in the Tehachapi Pass in California, trying to get his wind turbines up by midnight. And the reason they needed to be up by midnight is that tax credits expired at midnight. So he got it up, he got his tax credit, the only problem is they blew down then, and he realized that the wind machines that were being built just did not work. So he ended up in Denmark, and he discovered that there was this wind turbines that were coming out of the sturdy Danish agricultural machinery industry, and as a result of, of uh, he started importing them, and at one point, 90% of all the wind turbines in the world were in California, and uh, that's how the wind industry got going. But then, uh, became for wind and solar what became known as the valley of death, the 1990s when people were, if they could, were hanging on by their fingernails because the economics were so adverse and the lack of interest. Uh, and it was not really till this century that really there was a rebirth of renewables, uh, partly reflecting continued technological improvement, decline in costs, especially <coughs> dramatic declines in the costs of solar, and it intersected with climate. And uh, that for me was also a very interesting question because I started to say, how did climate become such a big issue? Because the interest in climate only really started in the 1830s with a few scientists, principally a scientist named Louis Agassiz, uh, who uh, was a Swiss scientist. He camped out on a hut on a Swiss glacier and he proposed a shocking theory. His shocking theory was that before this age, there had been a preceding age called the Ice Age, and that the glaciers in Switzerland were left over from that old age. And so a small group of scientists began to fear that there, if there had been an Ice Age, they started to say, well, could there be another Ice Age? And they talked about a Siberian winter too, but they didn't mean it like in 1947. They meant the return of the glaciers, which they were uh, afraid would obliterate uh, European civilization. Um, and so that's when the kind of research on climate started. And so the question I had is how did an idea held by these small group of scientists fearful of another ice age, a permanent Siberian winter, become such a dominating political uh, idea and not about things getting colder but about things getting warmer. I thought I would write one chapter on it. I found it so totally interesting that I ended up writing six chapters on it. And one of the things I saw is that all these ideas have been around for a long time, but it was really only in this century that it became a political force, and it took renewables out of the valley of death. It started in Germany with its very generous incentives and subsidies for renewables, and I have to say no country benefited more from German energy policy than China, because it was German energy policy that created the incentives to, to the build out of this Chinese solar industry and the Chinese dominate uh, the global solar business today. In fact, when I started the book, uh, I went into Germany to interview the founder of uh, what was then the world's largest supplier of solar panels, uh, uh, a German company, and by the time I finished the book, I had to rewrite it because the company had gone bankrupt because of the Chinese competition. So we've seen great growth in renewables around the world. It's been driven by technology improvements, scale, lower costs, government policies and mandates, and subsidies and incentives, and the overarching theme of climate change. And uh, at IHS, we collect the numbers on how much is spent on renewables, and you can see the difference in scale. In 2005, $55 billion was spent worldwide on renewable electricity. In 2015, $250 billion, in other words, a five-fold increase. Altogether, $1.6 trillion has been spent 
uh, over this decade on renewable electricity. So it's gone from being a small business to a big business. And now the post-Paris climate conference, there are new policy drivers, international consensus to lower carbon. Uh, but I do find a difference in thinking about climate change in Europe and North America on one side and China and India on the other side. In Europe and North America, in a way, it's an abstract idea. It's about what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years rather than what's happening right now. Uh, I've been recently both in China and India, and there in the discussions it's clear that it's much more imminent, but it's because climate change blends together with these awful problems of urban pollution that they have, which have a huge cost, economic cost, a health cost, a social cost, and perhaps a political cost, uh, and an urgent need to address it. So. Dealing with climate change is also to deal with urban pollution because you're really the same way trying to deal with carbon in the air. Now, earlier I said that shale and fracking is the biggest innovation so far. And um, the question is, what's going to be next? And is it going to be batteries? Is it going to be storage of electricity, which really ch would change the economics of wind and solar and re renewable? would tip their balance, and would really then prove that Lord Kelvin was absolutely right? Um, or is it specifically the electric car? And again, here is an example of a small group uh, that wanted to build an electric car called the Tesla. It was a crazy idea. The last time a new car company started in the United States was 1925. Um, and uh, at our conference, we had the chief technology officer of uh, Tesla, and then I just actually saw him last Friday as well. And, um, you know, it's interesting how things came, come about. Uh, he and a friend went to have lunch with uh, Elon Musk, whose name is now mo known to many people, and they had this great idea that they wanted to convince him to fund. And he asked, what's your great idea? And they said, we want to build an electric airplane. And his response was, not interested. Uh, at the end of the lunch, he casually asked them, well, what else are you interested in? And he said, oh, electric car. And he said, oh, I'm interested in that, and I'll fund it. And so that was really the start in about 2003, 2004 of Tesla. Last Friday, uh, I saw uh, J.B. Straubel, as a chief technology officer, 12 hours after they had launched the, uh, the Model 3. This is meant to be a very competitive car. Uh, the price is $35,000. Uh, with a tax credit, it's $27,000. Um, in the first 24 hours, 232,000 were ordered. Where that meant 232,000 people put down $1,000 and said, I want to pick up my car in 2018, 2019. Um, and I think we may look back on this and say, uh, this was a Tesla moment. Uh, maybe this really, maybe even more than the Paris conference, could have been a, a turning point. Because I think every, you know, this is not just something seen in some parts of the world. Everywhere in the world, when I was in uh, Saudi Arabia recently, people were talking to me about the Tesla. So it's really uh, raising a question is how are the energy systems going to change? But even as J.B. Strobel said, uh, transitions don't happen overnight. It's going to take decades uh, to change the automobile fleet. They're competing with more efficient cars. Uh, they're also competing with something that's been noticed that uh, millennials don't have the same intensity in terms of owning cars uh, as older generations do. Uh, they don't need the car for freedom. They have freedom through uh, social uh, networks and so forth. And I know this is something that automobile companies are kind of struggling uh, with that question. So what kind of transition is ahead? The world will need more energy. More and more of it will be dependent on electricity. By 2040, world economy could double. The number of cars, despite what I just said, uh, because of growth in the emerging markets, could double to two billion. What will be the mix of energy? Uh, one of the things I've noticed from the work I've done over the years is that there's a consensus that forms, and every uh, three or four years, the consensus changes. In 2008, the rage was biofuels, ethanol. That was the, uh, that was the, uh, the great hope, and it, that's completely faded away. So the true answer is this. We don't know. Um, we try in our own work to frame our thinking by looking at things through scenarios. And really, th we have three distinct views of the world. One we call rivalry, which is really fierce competition among energy sources. Price is very important. And maybe that's the path we're on right now. 
But the second, and maybe this is more borne out with what's just happened with Tesla, we call autonomy, which was much more renewables, much more distributed energy, assumes that storage becomes, of electricity becomes more, uh, more prevalent, and strong climate policies. There's a third scenario, which is a more troubling one, and that's reflected in the world today, too, and very much on the minds of decision makers around the world, including the U.S. Federal Reserve. Um, which is a weaker, more volatile world economy. And that is the worst economy for investment in anything because it's so uncertain. Well, in all of this, policy will matter. So will price is the great signal. And so often it seems to me the importance of price gets underestimated. Technology will, of course, be central. And what will be critical will be innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, risk-taking, going against conventional wisdom. And I think the role of, um, of individuals uh, and small groups uh, challenging uh, the established wisdom. Lord Kelvin may have been wrong about coal, but he was right about many other things, including how critical energy is to an economy. And um, he also uh, did something else. He led to the rediscovery of uh, somebody named Sadi Carnot. Uh, in finishing the quest, I wanted to find a way to tie it together, and I came to focus on this individual. Engineering students will know the Carnot cycle, but Sadi Carnot himself is not very well known. Uh, but his work was a critical input into the second law of thermodynamics. He was an engineer and scientist at the beginning of the 19th century, but he was also a soldier. His father had actually been Napoleon's minister of war, and he was convinced that one reason that Britain had defeated France in the Napoleonic Wars was because of the mastery of the steam engine, mastery of technology. And even then, you could see energy and geopolitics coming together. And so he wanted to teach the French how to think about this systematically. And in 1824, he wrote a, a little book called Reflections on the Motor Force of Fire. Um, it got virtually no attention. He died a few years later of cholera, and his papers were burned because of that. Uh, but Kelvin heard about this, this book, and he wanted to find out about it, and he actually searched for it in the old bookstall on the banks of the River Seine. Couldn't find it. There's no internet to you know, find things quickly. And so he, uh, but eventually somebody sent it to him, and he published an article in the uh, Transactions of the Edinburgh Royal Society uh, about it that became a basis of the second law of thermodynamics. But Carnot made a comment in his 1824 paper, which really st struck me, because he said that with a steam engine for the first time, energy had really been harnessed by humanity. And he said it, had, as a result, had produced a great revolution in human affairs. And I reflected upon that, and it was true then. And that great revolution has certainly continued uh, in the two centuries since then, as measured in the kind of innovation and change that we're seeing. And, uh, in a scale that could not possibly have been imagined. And uh, in ways that we now see, and in ways I think we cannot see now, uh, this great revolution, powered by innovation, will, will continue uh, uh, in the decades ahead. It will be required to respond to the realities of energy resources and the environment and the demands of the market. And it will be needed, urgently needed, to meet the challenges of the future and the needs of a growing world. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Jurgen. My name is Mark Trevelyan. I'm studying uh, international relations at Oxford. Um, I'm curious, for students of international security, there's a tendency to ascribe geopolitical intrigue to um, energy, and especially this most recent glunt. Um, the idea that the Saudis or the Gulf countries especially concerned with um, emerging capacity in the U.S. are trying to starve out those um, unconventional drillers. Um, that's sort of a dominant narrative within at least international security circles. I'm curious how much water does that narrative hold um, and to what extent is it, you know, are the Saudis just as much anyone responding to um, market forces much bigger than themselves? So the, I think they saw it in competitive terms, but not only U.S., but also Russian oil, Brazilian oil. But in particular, I think something that actually um, well, and then I should say what you, what you say, that the, then the geopolitical conspiracy theories grow. And there was one theory that the Saudis and the Obama administration got together to bring down the uh, 
uh, price of oil in order to hurt Russia, something you hear in Moscow, but I can assure you that the Obama administration and the Saudis, uh, there was no way that that was going to happen. I think that the I think the most important geopolitical aspect of it is actually the tensions between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. And I think that's really uh, the biggest driver because uh, the intensity of the rivalry, uh, I mean, after all, there's a proxy war going on in Yemen between them, uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, Hezbollah, all of those things. And I think uh, what the Saudis de were determined was not to give up market share to, um, to Iran as it came back after the nuclear agreement. Uh, into the marketplace, and uh, I think wanted to reestablish their preeminence as a global supplier. So shale was part of it, but I think it was the larger competitive situation, and I think the the Iranian side of it, and that's why I think it's going to be tough for them to, you know, come to an agreement. They don't even have diplomatic relations currently. The animosity is so great. Uh, my name is Ariel Bergman. I'm an energy economist at the University of Dundee, and. Speaking of unconventionals in fracking, there are the, some who think that it's actually a very quick phase, that it will not become a global resource that's developed, and others who are saying it will, that it's actually still an immature technology that has great depth yet to, to be discovered. And I was wondering, what do you feel about that? Both. <laughs> But let oh, me, that's uh, cheap. No, no, I'm going to, but wait, I'm going to elaborate. I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to duck it. Uh, I think that, um, um, you know, I think there was a tendency at the beginning and early to sort of say it was just a blink and it was going to go away. But I think uh, the resilience, I think it's still a, a young technology in developing. Uh, but it does seem primarily limited to North America right now. Uh, obviously, it was a controversial question here in the UK in terms of developing it. Um, I think, you know, some areas where people were hopeful, like Poland, it didn't turn out. But I was struck when I was in Saudi Arabia, they have three big shale projects going on because they want to produce gas. So I think it's, uh, it's a technology that's going to continue to develop. And one of the things that surprised people is how resilient this industry has been in the face of low prices. And I think it's because of continuing innovation. So I think it's going to be a part of it. But, you know, still keep in mind that its share of overall world supply is still, it is a small part, but a decisive part. Hi, my name is Hayden Dom, and I'm studying sustainable energy at Imperial College. I was hoping to follow up on the discussion of solar as well as market forces. I've heard the argument that the Chinese industry flooding the market with cheap photovoltaics could in the end be a bad thing possibly for the industry, because once they've driven out the higher quality competition, they could then increase the prices, and so within a couple of years, we could see a dramatic change. I was wondering if you might have any comments on that. Well, I think it, um, you know, I think that's a, it's a very good question, and the, the fact is that we don't know what the behavior of these Chinese companies will be. Right now, one reason prices are so low, it's not only technological improvement, but it's overcapacity, as you're suggesting, in Chinese uh, uh, factories that were built with cheap credit and so forth. And when that capacity gets squeezed out or demand grows, um, you know, maybe we won't continue to see these kind of cost declines. So I, I think it's just that answer is not clear yet. But as you're suggesting, one of the big, one of the reasons, there are other reasons, technological advances, but also just uh, huge capacity in China uh, in, in terms of production, and like so many other Chinese industries now, actually suffering from overcapacity. Uh, I don't want you to think I only wrote about bankrupt people, but I also wrote about uh, the, uh, the man who for a time was the richest man in China, who started, I think it was called Suntech, and uh, his company, uh, he was at the forefront, world's largest producer. He too went bankrupt, and I think they lifted his passport after that, and he couldn't leave China. But it was uh, another example uh, that sort of bears out the condition that you describe. Hi, uh, my name is Hope Brecher, and I'm a student at the University of Edinburgh um, in Science, Technology, and Society. And I was wondering, um, you mentioned a little bit about the BRICS countries and also about kind of po the possibility of the importance of batteries in the future. And so I was wondering if you could speak about um, if all these off-grid technologies, um, solar and wind, that are spreading around more in the global south uh, that aren't 
reply or that don't depend on kind of the large scale grid system that we have um, kind of in the global north and the associated political structures um, that come with that kind of power of a grid that connects countries, um, how you think that will change kind of the political structure? I, I don't know, political structure, I mean it is, um, which are, you know, distributed energy, I mean it's particularly I think applies more to solar than it does to wind. Uh, but uh, if people have storage uh, and they're only partly on the grid, I mean, it changes. I mean, a lot of utilities are going through questioning. I mean, uh, the German utilities have lost, I don't know, 80, 90 percent of their market value because of the kind of actually phenomenon that you're describing. Um, so a lot will depend upon uh, battery technology. But it's also, um, you know, one of the other people who is at, at our conference is actually this is sort of a, the counter view in a way, uh, to some degree, State Grid, which is the Chinese uh, largest utility in the world, uh, they invest about $75 billion a year. And he um, is a very big advocate of renewables, but an advocate of utility scale renewables. And maybe that's where some of the battle is now between distributed and utility scale. And his vision is that there will be just one global electric grid that he will build and that he's looking forward to building, uh, which, uh, but that would really bring renewable resources. In fact, they just did a study on the wind resources of uh, the North Pole and the solar resources of, uh, of the equator. And so, uh, but I think that, you know, the trend that we do see is towards, to some degree at least, more distributed systems. I don't know that that would have huge, it would have huge implications for utilities. I'm not sure it would have huge political implications as I think about it. Uh, my name is Brandon. I'm studying political sociology at LSE. Um, I would like you to sort of talk a little bit about or comment on sort of a private versus public investment with regards to innovation. You, took, you talked a lot about innovation and sort of bounce between sort of state responses and private responses. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how they behave differently, uh, where they compete or collaborate, um, how we might sort of think about these two together, their dynamics together. I think we should also ask Principal O'Shea to talk about, to join in that question, because you've been part of it, about the role of public and private uh, investment in innovation. Come on. <laughs> he's been at the forefront of it, and he's, uh, I think it's a mixture. Uh, uh, you, you know, I guess the answer is you need both. I mean, we were just talking about uh, Xerox Park. No, you should tell them about Xerox Park. Go ahead. Bring the, give them, don't let them off the hook. <laughs> so the, the Xerox Park story is an, an interesting um, attempt to deal with the future. The, so the Xerox Corporation ha had um, the patents on photocopying. They saw uh, that um, by the beginning of the 80s they were going to lose that. They were going to lose control. Um, <clears throat> and what they did was highly rational. This is, they said, oh, computing is the coming thing. So they basically could look, took 10 years of, of anticipated profits, uh, invested it all in a wonderful laboratory, the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, uh, and most of the things that you see on your iPad or your smartphone were invented there. They, they recruited the best generation of computer scientists. Uh, they saw their economic peril, and they said, you know, forget about photocopying, just do your best. And... Uh, by the late 70s, people were wandering around with things that, you, if you saw them now, you'd say, that's an iPad. And they were sitting there, and, uh, and they had capacitance screens, and you, you had Windows and mouse, the mouse and everything. And when it was all done, and it was bundled up in a computer called the Alto, uh, the Xerox Corporation looked at it 10 years later and said, gosh, this is not a copying machine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve Jobs came and looked and said, oh, and Microsoft came and looked, and a number of people saw straight away. So I think, yeah, I, think it, I think it can be very difficult. You know, you can have a really good intuition about the way a supply chain or technology is going. Uh, you can invest uh, massively in it, and then, you, and then you can just get it wrong. Yeah. I think that um, uh, uh, it's a very dramatic story, I mean, because it touches everybody's lives. Um, I think... You know, the internet started off as, 
U.S. after the, at least as I understand, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, realizing that there was no way for the president to communicate with these bases if in event of nuclear war. And so that was the DARPA, which was the U.S. Defense Department, funded it. And I think a lot of the innovations uh, result from that. I headed a task force in energy R&D for the U.S. Department of Energy. And so, you know, strongly believe there's a public role and a private role that they kind of coexist together. And then, but I'm also struck by um, the role of individuals and or small groups driving it. I asked um, uh, the um, chief technology officer of Tesla, you know, about innovation and, you know, what they did. He said there's nothing romantic about it. He said it was really uncomfortable and unpleasant and very stressful, but it was, you know, driven. So I think things build upon each other. And the other thing that you notice often that things, it's bringing technologies together that lead to, you know, to the breakthroughs of things being different. So, uh, you know, I don't know if you were thinking, I, I don't think there's a theological answer to that. I think they both have a role and that, um, uh, that you need the public investment and, uh, and you need universities. And, and, but it's just interesting, um, um, are any of the marshals from MIT this year? Okay. <laughs> Okay, non Marshall. Okay. Oh, she's Marshall. Okay. So anyway, so we had Jeff Immelt, the CEO of General Electric, at uh, at our at our conference, and General Electric has announced that it's moving from the bucolic uh, splendor of Fairfield, Connecticut, to downtown Boston. And I, um, has anybody any Marshalls from Harvard? Okay. So I asked him, why are you moving to Boston? So he said. We want to be near MIT and other universities. <laughs> but I think it's a sense of it's really the, uh, the, you know, the relationship between public and private investment and universities and research that all come together in a way that's you know, not really predictable in a linear way. But, but, create, but he's moving there because he wants to be in an ecosystem that promotes innovation. And I think it's a combination of them. Um, yeah, my name's Simon Shackley from the School of Geoscience at the University of Edinburgh. Um, in the climate change community nowadays, we're talking a lot about unburnable fossil fuel reserves. And so various estimates, maybe two thirds of, of known reserves are unburnable. A lot of that being oil and gas in the Middle East, North America, Russia, Australasia. And in your talk, although you did refer to Paris, but Quite a few things you said were, were sort of assuming that, you know, when oil price goes down, governments will actually promote measures to stimulate investment again, which is the normal way of thinking. Shale gas reserves and oil being opened up. But in a way, this is running completely counter to what we require if we're going to keep within two degrees limit. And this seems, you know, I'm just interested in your thoughts on this tension and in, in the, the sort of security aspects of that. I think it is a tension because I think the question, I mean, for many countries, it's going to be a question of economic growth. And so, I mean, China now sells more cars than the United States. Are the, is the Chinese government going to, and they look on automobiles as a major source of employment, so are they going to prohibit or stop it? Um, you know, I think you're quite right to put it in terms of it, it's a tension between uh, multiple uh, objectives. I think it's also not out of the question that maybe there'll be other solutions to carbon than, you know, not using it. But I think, um, I mean, but if you look at it, you're going to certainly see, and that's why I said it's a rivalry, you're going to see um, a lot of effort to change the mix, and it's going to be a question how quickly does it happen. And I think a lot will depend upon political decisions, maybe some including what happens in November in the United States. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Ben Dasherberle, and I study uh, international relations at Oxford. I'm wondering... In, in the same program? Yeah, we actually are in the same program. Um, <laughs> tag teaming. Um, so I'm wondering, does the relative abundance of oil right now because of these new technologies mean that the strategic importance of traditional oil producing areas such as the Middle East will decline in the long run? relatively speaking permanently, or is this just a blip and will the long-term geopolitical importance of these other oil-producing regions persist in the long run? Well, I think um, 
the combination of the Iranian nuclear deal combined with the growth of shale, leading people to think the U.S. is energy independent, which it's not, but its major source of oil is Canada, um, has made certainly in the Middle East people worried that they're not strategically, don't have the same strategic importance as in the past. And I think that will be kind of a, you know, you hear t elements of that in this presidential campaign. Uh, you heard elements of that in President Obama's inter long interview in the Atlantic magazine. So I think that is uh, on the mind because, of course, there is a, you know, a large commitment there. And at the same time, that region is probably, in many ways, m it's, this is one of the most unstable periods that it's had. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think... I remember when I wrote a, an article about what was happening in shale early on, I remember being um, at a defense think tank and, you know, sort of people saying for the first time, well, you know, let's examine our assumptions. So I think it is, I think there will be a, an examination of it, although the answer will also be that if, even if it's the U.S. imports less, I mean, it's the, the U.S. is part of a global trading system. Uh, and that global trading system still depends a lot on those resources and access to those resources. But I think it's, it's um, you know, quite different than a uh, situation than when uh, Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait when there's a very different level of dependence. Hey, I'm Mike Norton. I do politics at Oxford. Just to tag a little bit off Ben's question. Are you in the same program too? Uh, yeah, uh, same department. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, someone told me recently that Saudi Arabia has five years of oil reserves and they've gone through a year already. Financial reserves. Yeah. Do, do you think that in the next decade Saudi Arabia could go well, bankrupt? Well, um, uh, I don't think so. I, I mean, they've gone through, you know, their financial reserves are back to the level. Uh, they've gone through like $130 billion. They're back to the level of financial reserves of 2012. They have a lot of demands. 70% of the population is 30 years and younger. Uh, they have a war in Yemen, uh, a lot of other interests, so the financial pressure. And it's interesting to see this new deputy crown prince who is 30 years old and is the power in the kingdom. Uh, his talking about diversifying their economy, I don't know if he's worrying exactly about the problem that you cite it, but certainly saying we shouldn't be so dependent upon uh, oil and wanting Saudi Arabia to be a financial power as well as an oil power, and uh, things that would never have been thought, you know, taking part of Saudi Aramco and as a selling its stock on the world market. So I think they, their, their view is that they are, that they need to be less dependent upon oil and diversify their economy. It's a big challenge uh, to do that. Um, but I think if, if prices remain low for another, five years, it would be a big problem, but I think they have the elbow room for the next couple of years, and they're assuming, like most people, that their price will recover, that at the level of prices now, you're not going to see new investment. I mean, the North Sea is going to become a dead sea in terms of investment, and that will be the case uh, around the world, and therefore, the markets will adjust to that. But they certainly are feeling the financial pressure. Thank you, Dr. Jurgen. Um, my name is Shea Hulan, and I study choice architecture and nudges at Oxford, but more importantly, I got my start at Sussex. Uh, I was very taken with what you had to say today about global energy trends, um, but I was even more interested in what you had to say, or at least in what you were implicating, I think, maybe about the process of making macro predictions. And I was wondering if you had to speculate, what, if anything, have we learned in the last several years about making these types of predictions? Well, I think it's um, the role of surprise. Uh, that's why, I mean, I've become a more and more believer in scenarios as a way to at least look at different assumptions and different factors. I have to say, though, somebody sent me an email uh, yesterday, you know, one makes, gets things right and gets things wrong, but somebody watched uh, a lecture that I'd done in 2011, and I said, in a half decade, we'll know whether the electric car is a niche or is going to really take off, and it's exactly a half a decade since then, and I think, we're, I think that was not a bad prediction. Uh, but uh, what we found in doing the scenarios 
uh, so often is that the scenario that seems to be the offbeat one that people don't think is going to happen is actually the one that ha that does happen. And I look at the energy field, and it's, you know, whatever you're talking about, it's long term in terms of investment. And every three or four or five years, it, it's a if if it's a different world. So I think it's, um, you know, trying to have a flexible mind and seeing things that, you know, try and see things that challenge your own assumptions, and uh, and look for the indicators. Uh, of change, but um, you know, if you look at um, you know, in 2007, the conviction was we could not possibly have another recession. It was known as the great moderation of the global economy, and one of the reasons is that central bankers were a lot smarter than they used to be. And then 2008 happened. So, uh, you know, so at least I find trying to think in scenarios as a way to kind of challenge your own thinking as well as other people's thinking. Is, is a way, and not trying to say this is more likely than that, but um, is, you know, so we've, we've done a, a lot. Um, one of the early studies I did was on the subject of forecasting. The title was The Perils of Prophecy, so it was exactly uh, along your theme. But it's something that one struggles with all the time as you look back at predictions and you see how wrong they, they are or that they miss something really big. Um, my name is Brad Hacker, and I study war, but my question is more about economics. How much worse do you think 2008 would have been without shale? And do you think shale was the primary? Was Would 2008 would have been? Would we have gone into a deep depression versus just a recession without shale? And how much of the recovery was more due to shale and the innovation than to government policy? Well, I think that's kind of what Ben Bernanke was saying in that quote, I mean, there was really a, there were no jobs being created except in that industry, and there were well over two million jobs that were created as a result of that. So it was a real stimulus, it was a real stimulus to American manufacturing, because you had these supply chains that went all across the country. So I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but I think without it, two things would have happened. I mean, I think the recovery would have been even more difficult. I think the result of the stimulus it would be interesting to go back you know, and look and say, you know, how did that work out? The other thing that would have happened, we would actually have had a very tight oil market at a time when the world was really in, uh, in a very difficult situation. So it probably would have been, actually I hadn't thought about that, would, would have been a worse situation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jurgen, for your talk. Uh, my name is Shama Ams. I'm studying post-conflict reconstruction and development at Cambridge. Um, I had a question kind of following along the theme of conspiracies. A lot has been made about the, you know, the Asian uh, Investment Infrastructure Bank uh, and so sort of that geostrategic implication versus the United States and TTIP uh, and whether TTIP is an attempt for the United States to encircle China. Um, and versus also, you know, um, um, what's going on vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, um, TPP. Um, so um, I was w wondering whether those concerns are accurate and then also what implications they would have for energy policy. Well, it's, it's striking to see, you know, you've gone to really what is maybe the fundamental geopolitical relationship in the 21st century, which is China and the United States. On the one hand, you see how interconnected those two countries are. There are 300,000 Chinese students studying in the United States. There are 25,000 studying in Russia. So it just tells you how, uh, you know, that's just one example of how connected they are. On the other hand, there's also uh, uh, the rivalry that e exists and, um, you know, particularly South China Sea and uh, the Chinese view that they are be encircled and that they've been held back and now it's their turn. Um, and uh, the, that of the U.S. and also the countries in the region, that they're more and more integrated with China, but that on the other hand, China is also becoming a very dominant power in the, in the region. Um, so I think that one element, uh, the trade agree the Pacific Trade Agreement, clearly the one country that's not part of it is China. And I think uh, that it is that part of the argument is that if this fails, if this doesn't happen, um, then U.S. influence in the region will recede and U.S. credibility in the region will recede. And uh, I think the, the One Belt, One Road, the Asian Development Bank, all of those infrastructure development banks, I think there is a geopolitical uh, part to it. But I also think it goes back to the question about um, overcapacity in Chinese uh, manufacturing, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that the Chinese, 
see themselves needing markets, and they would need to stimulate those markets and uh, st stimulate world trade, and that they would be a beneficiary of it. Uh, the irony of this kind of um, uh, competition, if we can call it that, or rivalry, as well as collaboration with, uh, between China and the United States, is that probably no country has benefited more from freedom of the seas supported by the US, by the US, US Navy than China, because China has been such a beneficiary of an open global economy. So I think it's, you know, you know, we hear the political debates going on now. I think a lot of work really needs to go into trying to emphasize the collaborative sides of the relationship and not have it be seen as a sort of, uh, you know, pre-World War I Germany versus Britain type situation, because it is the most important relationship. Uh, I'm Oz Geberich. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at University of Dundee. My question will be... In which, in which, faculty, which faculty? Uh, Center for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral Law, and Policy. It's a quite long run. <laughs> so you know this gentleman. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, my question will be about uh, the more policy side of especially uh, oil uh, companies. With the Panama Papers, we can see the names who have key roles in international energy policy, especially on national oil companies or national energy policies. So uh, after those papers revealed and the general trend in the world is uh, demanding more transparency by the civil society and the uh, national nationals of the oil rich companies. So can we expect any shift and more transparency or based on those regulations? Right. Well, you've obviously read much more extensively than I have. I've just been reading the British press and it all seems to be focused on people in Britain. So, uh, <laughs> uh, um, so I don't know what personalities show up, but uh, Obviously, you know, I think there is kind of more and more transparency, and this will, I think, really, will really accelerate it and put pressure on countries that uh, have secret, uh, 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 secrecy around their banking. And I mean, I think it means more transparency for, you know, forces transparency on many, will force transparency on many countries. Uh, we've seen, I mean, ironically, that the first casualty you wouldn't have expected it to be the pre prime minister of Iceland, you know, but, uh, but there'll, there'll be a lot more. So I'll have to, afterwards, you'll have to tell me some of the names you've come across. <laughs> See if I know. I'm Kobe Mensa from the University of Dundee again. Going back to predictions and what next, um, where, where do you see Africa? This a visa continued relationship with China and their strengthening presence in, in Africa. You, you know, I talked about the super cycle in commodities, and probably, um, I don't know if we can say that Africa was truly a huge beneficiary, and uh, much more in terms of rising incomes came from that than from, you know, decades of, of foreign aid. And it was really a big stimulus, and you heard much more about an African middle class and so forth. So I think that the fall in oil prices that uh, many African countries are uh, casualties uh, of that, not only oil prices, but commodity prices in general, and that it's a setback for uh, African uh, development. Obviously, the continent is uh, rich in resources, but uh, some of the projects that were thought about were very, uh, were relatively expensive and will be seen as more expensive in, in this environment. So I think it's probably a bit s slower growth for Africa than we've seen over the last 10 years. I mean, it's just striking how many countries uh, benefited from the super cycle in commodities and what a boost it was to them. And, uh, you know, it's, maybe I'll just come back to one point. If in November 2014 you had said oil prices are going to come down by 70 percent, you know, most economists would say, that's great, that's going to be like a huge tax cut, it's going to be a big stimulus to the world economy. And I was just reading a paper last week by the IMF saying why it hasn't happened. And there are a lot of reasons. I think part of it goes back to the thing we we're talking about, development in the United States, where uh, so much investment resulted from that. And I think it's also because of the changing balance in the world economy. And so emerging markets, uh, Africa, but many other countries, uh, Brazil is a, with its additional problems of 
corruption uh, hard hit. So uh, it's, it's been a mixed blessing. And I think that the head of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, last week said something to the effect that we've learned that not only high oil prices can be bad for the world economy, but low oil prices can be too, and particularly when it affects other commodities as well in countries in different stages of development. One advantage of being an ex-chair of the Marshall Aid Commemoration Commission is one gets to do the nice things without having to do very much work. So um, let me say, uh, Dan, it's a particular and personal pleasure. Um, we once shared many years ago in Cambridge the same supervisor when we were writing our PhDs. Um, and I think you've seen this evening some of the things that makes Dan such a a unique person to cover not just history and politics and science and economics and technology and a touch of futurology thrown in. Uh, there are very few people who can bring all of those things together in the way you have. So thank you very much for doing that this evening in this 60th and last 60th anniversary lecture. Um, but it's also a particular pleasure to uh, uh, give you the Marshall Medal, and I'll read the citation. Uh, Dr. Jurgen is honored for his commitment to the Marshall Scholarship Program, uh, being a member of the advisory uh, board of the Association of Marshall Scholars, and his significant contribution to furthering UK-US relation, UK relations, particularly in the field of energy. Many congratulations. Can I just say a few more thanks, firstly to Sir Timothy and uh, his colleagues at the University of Edinburgh, and if I may say, not just for the lecture this evening, but every time the marshals have come to Edinburgh, your university has always looked after us very well indeed. For that, we're very grateful indeed. And if I may particularly thank Robert Laurie, who's done so much work, not on this visit, but on previous visits as well. Thank you very much indeed, Robert. And finally, thank you all for coming this evening. I think the, the questions, as well, as well as the answers, have shown the depth and range of knowledge of those of you in the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, this ends the 60th anniversary lecture. Thank you. Thank you.